Hey everybody! For this video I thought I'd talk about a few of the audio description experiences I've had in London since moving here, especially recently. Um, before I moved here I never used audio description all that much, I didn't really feel the need to. Um, when I was watching the TV I would just sit close enough to see it, I could do that at home. Same with things on my computer like Netflix or Now TV. And when I went out to the cinema with friends I just got enough of the picture to be able to see it, you know, I could see well enough, you know, there would be little bits I miss, but no, otherwise I was happy just to watch the movie as it was, and there wasn't really anything theatre-wise locally enough to where I um, lived to really warrant going there. And the museums, well, what few there were near me, there's only a couple really I can think of, as far as I know, they didn't offer things like audio description, so no, I never really bothered with it, there was no need to, but since moving up to London, there's been a lot going on up here that I've become aware of, particularly from uh, Vocalize. They're a brilliant charity organisation that uh, highlight and arrange all these different audio tours and touch tours of museums and theatre productions and things like that. And then I want to other things as well. In terms of theatre productions, there's also the Society of London Theatres, SOLT. They also produce an access brochure, quarterly I think it is, highlighting theatre productions with audio description. No, not just vocalised ones, but other ones as well. So yeah, there's things like that going on. So yeah, I've just been trying a few of these things out now, recently, and um, I've been enjoying them very much. So I just thought I'd talk about a few of them. We'll start off with the museums. Uh, the first experience I had of audio description and handling objects at a museum was the Natural History Museum. I went with a local visually impaired group that I've become a member of. It was one of my first outings with them. We went to see uh, the Investigate Gallery, which has things like snake skins and giant turtles and all sorts of other things. It was really good just to go in there uh, with the staff. We had a couple of members of staff with us and they let us handle all these different things and they told us all about them. We could chat to them and ask questions. It was really, really good. The hours just flew by. They were really friendly, really good. Everyone got a chance to feel everything. Everyone got a chance to handle everything. The photo you can see of me, to me holding a piece of zebra fur, which you think is white, you think zebras are white, but actually they're more a brownie colour. It's just the way the light reflects off them. Just little things like that are quite interesting. Since then I've been back to the museum again, because there's so much to see at the Natural History Museum. You can't go wrong by going there. They've got that new massive skeleton of a, a whale now in their great hall, in the Hintzy Hall, which replaces Dippy the Dinosaur. It's better to be seen from up above, I've found. Looking at it from below, it's kind of dark on the underside and the way the lighting is coming from above, it's just too dark below to see the detail. When you go up on the balconies and the light's shining down on it, it does look amazing. Um, but one thing I did try there on that particular visit was an audio tour of their Human Evolution Gallery, um, because they've got three audio tours that you can download on their website, three audio description tours. So I thought, well, I'll try one of those. I'll try the Human Evolution Gallery. And that was really good. It takes you through the gallery. There's about four sections in there. And it focuses on a one or two specific things in each area and really talks you through it and describes it and tells you about it and it's really really interesting it worked really well so there are a couple of other audio description tours that I intend to try there at some point as well. I also went to their exhibition about whales to go with this skeleton I was just talking about in effect and that was really good too it didn't have audio description but they did have a large print guide there. My only criticism with that was a it wasn't always easy to find out which way to go because it kind of jumped around a little bit. There was a sort of logical order to it, but it, you had to kind of hunt for the next exhibit on one or two occasions. And also, I don't know if it was just the guide I had, but it was bound back to front. So page one was at the back and you'd turn back to page two, page three. It was the opposite order to the way you'd expect a book to go. So that was a bit weird. But yeah, otherwise it was really good and it's great that museums are making the effort with large print and audio description, so that was really good. Another museum I've been to is the Museum of London Docklands. I went there with Mum. Uh, Vocalise had been advertising an audio described tour of their Sailor Town exhibition. So me and Mum went there and it turned out we were the only people who had booked onto that day. So we got a personalised tour with the very generous guide. You know, he could have said, no, there's just two of you, I won't bother. But he did, he took us round and it was really interesting. He was really nice. It is quite dark in there, so it's quite useful to have someone to describe what was going on. We got to hear some sounds as well. We got to smell some things. Sit in this small um, war shelter that was used by emergency services. And there's so much interesting stuff in there, some really interesting stories. Museums are well worth going to, because there's all these little hidden stories that you really just don't know about. So that was a really good tour. And then the most recent one I went to was at the British Museum. And this was again advertised by Vocalise, and indeed put on by Vocalise. They had a Vocalise describer there, and a curator there as well, 
for this particular exhibition, which was the Hokusai Beyond the Great Wave exhibition. Hokusai being a very influential Japanese artist. And this was fascinating. I've not really been to art galleries before and I've always kind of wondered if I'd find them a bit dry or a bit boring. But this really brought it to life for me because we had a handling session beforehand so you could see and feel the wood blocks that he used, including one that was carved out with the design of the, the, uh, the painting that was going to result from it. And it was so intricate and so detailed and to feel that and to feel all the brushes and the paper and materials that he used to produce his imagery, it really helped to you know, underline how creative it was, how intricate it was, how complicated it was. And that made us appreciate uh, the artistry all the more in the exhibition itself. And we went through a few of the uh, key images in the exhibition, not every single one because it would take way too long, but we went through quite a few of the key exhibits and they were described in detail to us by the vocalised describer, but also because we had a curator there from the exhibition who really knew his stuff, he was able to give us all the context behind it, all the meaning behind it, all the information. So the audio description and the extra information really gelled together nicely, really interconnected well. And it was just really, like I say, really brought it all to life and really made it interesting. So much so that I actually got a DVD all about it as well. I never thought I'd buy an art DVD, but this is very interesting. And again, this had close-ups of paintings like The Great Wave, which is his most famous painting, which you can see on the front here. Uh, the DVD has lots of really tight close-ups of that, so I could see detail that even on the day I couldn't quite see. But on the day I was able to use my monocular um, to look at the paintings. We also had a large print guide there as well, which I was using in conjunction with the audio description. And the large print guide has, as well as large print text, it has large versions of the paintings, very simplified kind of drawings, if you like. Well, I say simplified, they're still quite complex, but they have labels on as well, pointing to the different areas of the image. So by using that, it was basically a map for me. So I was looking at like the map of the painting on the paper and then using my monocular, in fact, which I can show you, because I've got it here. I don't know why I'm demonstrating with my hands, but this is my monocular that I use. So I can look at the paintings like that. And by comparing it with the map on the large print page, I'm able to look at each element of the painting and say, oh yes, yeah, so that's what that is. And that's what those are little people in boats on those waves. Like you were saying, yeah, I can see where they are now. I know where to look for them. So using all those different tools, the audio description, the creator's description, the large print guide, my monocular, putting it all together really helped to, like I say, bring it to life, make it interesting, really help me understand it and appreciate it more. And that's the kind of thing you need with art, I think. It's easy to look at these paintings and think, oh yeah, that looks nice, but to actually hear the stories behind it and to really be told about every element of it, it really does make it interesting. So if you think art's boring and you're visually impaired, I would strongly suggest looking on the Vocalise website for museums near you and just trying out one of these art tours because you might be surprised. I, I certainly was. So that was really good. That was really good fun. So those are a few museums, but there are a few other things I can mention as well. Um, it's not quite audio description, but I do love walking around London, and I have been trying out a couple of audio tour apps on my iPhone to try and get around city with, explore areas with. The best one I've had so far is called Cities Talking, and I did a tour using that around Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens, and it takes you into Green Park a bit at the end as well. And this particular tour was narrated by Christopher Biggins. It was really good fun, really interesting. Really easy to follow it around because you're just following the park around, essentially. And I was able to kind of wander off and find other parts of the park as well because Hyde Park's massive. And then kind of resume the tour and it was easy to follow the map on the app and get around it. So that was good. And then this past weekend I tried another tour on the app, um, which was called Death and Rebirth, which takes you around various parts of the square mile. The streets around there are a bit more of a maze and the map didn't really quite work so well. It was a little bit hard to find things. I got a little bit lost here and there, but I was able to find quite a few of the things that were mentioned. So it was worth giving a go to. And actually one of the things I found on that tour was a talking statue. Well, not exactly a talking statue, but it has a plaque on the side where if you scan the QR code on it, the person represented by the statue will call you, in effect, it's an actor obviously, but they will call you via the website and they tell you about themselves. And that's a really good way of doing it, it's really good. So I've looked at the website, talking statues, and there's a whole map which I've downloaded now, so I intend to kind of go out and see how many of these I can find. I know there's a cat voiced by Nicholas Parsons. Um, I know there's one done by Jamie Paxman. I think there's Hugh Dennis and various other people who have voiced various different statues of people and animals. So that's a really nice initiative, I think. That's a really clever idea. It's a shame that there aren't more and more statues 
in London that do that, but there's still quite a few, and there's some in Manchester and Leeds and places like that as well, I think. So well worth looking out for. But moving back indoors again, I want to finish by looking at cinema and theatre. So cinema, I went to a showing of Beauty and the Beast recently where the RNIB were testing an app that they've been testing, I think, once or twice before, but I think that was more in a home environment. This was one of the first times they've tested it in a cinema. It's not one of their apps. It's an app that someone else has developed. The app developer was there. But it's basically an app that lets you have audio description for movies on your phone. So rather than getting a headset given to you in the cinema, which I've never tried personally, apparently they're a bit temperamental, instead of that, you just take your mobile phone and you download the audio description track before you get there. And then when the film starts, you press play on your device and it will synchronise the audio to the film. So it will listen to the film and work out exactly what part of the audio description it needs to be in. And I tried this and it worked perfectly. Um, you know, you stick your earphones in and I press sync, press play, and it did it straight away. And the Disney logo for Beauty and the Beast started playing and the description for the logo kicked in immediately. So while the logos are playing, you've got a chance to adjust the volume and get it at a level that's right for you. So that went really nicely. The description for the film was great. Um, and the film was great as well, I think, certainly enhanced by the description. Again, I could have watched the movie without it, but having watched it with it, I do actually think I prefer watching movies with audio description. I think it does pick up a lot of like, the facial expressions and the smaller details, the things that like, props that people are picking up, that small perhaps that I might have missed, that do really help me to keep up with the story rather than catching up with little bits later, um, which I think I've kind of got so accustomed to before that you know, I haven't really thought about it, but it did really help. So if that app continues to be developed as the trials go along then I think yeah it would be uh, really really useful I know cinemas have been a bit reluctant to allow people in with mobile phones but you know if this kind of app can work then there's no reason why it shouldn't be rolled out more widely so yeah we'll, we'll see what happens there it'll be interesting to see if anything comes of that so the final thing I want to finish with is a trip to the theatre and this has been my favourite I think the Hocker Sci exhibition was a very close second, admittedly, but this was my favourite, I think, uh, because I hadn't really been aware of audio description in the theatre before. I think I vaguely knew it was a thing, but it's only since come to London that I've really been able to read about it and hear about how good people find it. And I was obviously very curious about it. I do love the theatre, even though I haven't really been that often for a while. Certainly when I used to come to London as a kid, we used to go to pantomimes and things. We went to see musicals, you know, I've been to see Oliver and Wind in the Willows and things like that in the past. And I went to see The Lion King most recently, uh, two or three years ago, with some friends of mine. But I hadn't been aware of audio description, like I say. So we wanted to try it, certainly, to see if it, you know, grab our interest and encourage us to go to more shows. I booked for Mum and I to go and see The Mousetrap at St Martin's Theatre. And basically what you get is you get a touch tour, and then you get the show itself with audio description. So we went down there, and there were quite a few people there uh, for the touch tour, which takes place a couple of hours before the play. And there were two describers from Vocalise there, and we got taken through the back corridors of the theatre and up onto the stage, where we got to meet the cast, and they said hello, welcomed us. And they didn't stay for the touch tour, because they obviously have to go off and relax and get ready for the show, which is fair enough. But they, they got to say hello to us, which was nice of them. And it also meant we got to hear their voices as well, so we could kind of recognise them later on. So that's another key aspect of it. But then the vocalised describers described the stage to us and everything that was on it. And then we were able to just go around and have a feel of everything and have a close look at it all. So, you know, there's a big old clock on the mantelpiece on the stage there, which I think is the only item that's been there for the entire run. Everything else has kind of changed in one form or another over the years. But that clock is the one constant that's always been there. Um, there's a couple of photos on the mantelpiece, one of which is actually of Agatha Christie herself, who wrote the play. And then there's the uh, seats, which are very comfy to sit in. And then we got led around the back of the stage and we got to fill some of the costumes and the jackets. And there was um, some ski poles that the policeman uses to get there through the snow. And we got to see the fake snow itself and the machine that they use to generate the wind. All these little secrets of the uh, backstage area, really, really interesting. So that really helped to give us some great context for the show. Uh, where everything was, where certain doors off the stage lead to, you know, in terms of the story and stuff like that. And we got to go outside and have a walk for half an hour while, you know, the theatre was getting ready to welcome everyone. So there was a bit of a gap there. And we went back into the theatre again and we got presented with our, our headset. I hadn't known what to expect from the headset, really. I thought perhaps it'd be headphones that go over your head, but they actually hang down. It's a little bit like a doctor's stethoscope, I suppose, but instead of the wire at the bottom, it's basically just a unit that just hangs under your chin, kind of hangs off your ears. And it's perfectly comfortable, it's, it's nice, and it's just got a couple of little dials on it. Uh, the main dial turns it on or off and adjusts the volume, so when you turn it on, you just keep turning it to turn it up. 
And then if you turn it all the way down and then click it off, it goes off. And then there's another little switch uh, which basically changes the channel so you can tune into the frequency of the vocalised describer who is elsewhere in the auditorium, presumably behind a window or something so they don't disturb any people near them. But yeah, I think what happens is the vocalised describers, they see a DVD of the show or they see a previous performance of the show, they write their kind of audio description script, if you like, and then they come in and do it live on the night while you're there. Because you can't really pre-record audio description for a theatre show because it's slightly different every night. You know, the timings are slightly different, things might go wrong, things might change, the director might change something. So you can't really do that so easy. So it has to kind of be live on the night. And it worked really, really well. I was really impressed with it, as was Mum. It really helped, again, to fill in the key things like the facial expressions. There were a couple of little props and things that got picked up that were crucial to the story. So we got to hear about those and it just helped to fill in all the gaps that we would otherwise have missed. Um, again, could I watch the show without it? Probably, but I would have been a bit late on the uptake on some of the more crucial elements, be they actual clues or red herrings or whatever they are. So yeah, it was really, really good. And The Mousetrap itself is a brilliant play. If you're not sure if you like something like that, Go anyway, trust me. It's really, really well written, really well put together. Um, all these different guests that arrive at this guest house all have their own story, all have their own characteristics. They're all very, very different. And it all comes together nicely. And there's twists and turns, there's red herrings. You know, I was never entirely sure who it was. You know, I had one or two names in mind. I didn't guess the final outcome. It's really, really good. So yeah, definitely go and see it if you can. So that's it. Those are my experiences of audio description in London so far. They've been brilliant and I'll definitely be doing more of them. They really enhance the experience, they really help me to enjoy and appreciate them more. Even though I can see fairly well, there are clearly still various details that I miss that it's great to hear about and great to kind of know about in time with everybody else rather than kind of figuring it out or seeing them later. It's kind of nice to be there in the moment and enjoy it properly. So I'll definitely be doing more. I've got more museum visits booked. The next theatre show I've got booked is Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, and that's a two-part play. I'm seeing both parts on the same day. Mum's paid for that as my birthday present for this month. And then there are other things as well. There'll be musicals I want to go and see, I always want to book on to. So it's it's tempting to book everything. <laughs> it is. It's a, But there are certainly things I'm kind of going to be aiming for to book soon. So uh, there is a lot of this kind of stuff out there. Like I say, check out Vocalize. They're the big one. V-O-C-A-L-E-Y-E-S. They list lots of things. Also Society of London Theatres. Um, I've got an access card now, uh, which I applied for very recently. That helps to give information to venues like the O2 about your condition. Um, not necessarily to give you a description necessarily, but it's just something else I thought I'd mention while I'm talking about theatres and venues and things. You can experience the culture, you can experience the arts, you can experience you know, the theatre and the cinema and museums and galleries. and You can go out for walks and you know all sorts of things you know there's no reason to think that being a disability here is a barrier because the support's there the technology's there so yeah if you're a londoner and you're visually impaired or if you're visiting the city and you're visually impaired you know there's there's plenty to check out so that's it for now though um thank you very much for watching i hope you found it interesting that you learned something from it like i say do check out these experiences if you're in the city as well it's well worth doing and i will see you for another video soon bye